This week, I want us to turn the dial a little bit, and we're going to look at the habits for physical health, specifically look at the effect of stress on your body and what the Bible says is the antidote to the most common stresses in your life. So if you're a little tired, a little worn down, a little stressed out, you picked a good week to come to church because we're gonna help you out as we look at the most famous psalm in the Bible, Psalm 23. And it's just six verses long, but we find the seven antidotes in these six verses. The Lord is my shepherd, so I have all I need. He makes me lay down in lush green meadows and he leads me beside calm, quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies and you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, I want us to today, in Psalm 23, take this passage and tear it apart line by line. And I want us to see that there are seven spiritual habits for reducing stress. The first cause of stress in your life is worry. And you worry because you think, well, I have what I need when I need it. And anytime you expect other people to meet your needs instead of God, you're gonna be frustrated, you're gonna be disappointed, and they're not gonna be able to, to, to measure up because nobody can meet all your needs. No man, no woman, only God can meet all your needs. So the first antidote to stress, this is an important one, write it down, look to God to meet all my needs. That's the first thing David says we need to do. I look to God to meet all my needs, and that calms me down. That way I'm not gonna be disappointed because I'm gonna trust in God. Now, this single change in your life, if you would stop looking to other people to meet your needs, if you would stop looking to your husband, to your wife, to meet your needs, you, your stress would go down dramatically. Stop putting your security in things that you can lose. Sometimes people put their security in their job. They lose their job, they lose their, their peace of mind. They put their security in their marriage and then their spouse dies or they go through the tragedy of a divorce and then they go, who am I? What is my identity? Or you put, your, you put your security in your money. There's a lot of ways you can lose your money. As your pastor and friend, I recommend you never put your security in anything that can be taken away from you. I'll say it again. You should always put your security, find your security in something that can never be taken from you. You can lose your job, you can lose your health, you can lose your reputation, you can lose your spouse, you can lose your mind, but you cannot lose your relationship to Christ. And so you put your security in that. You look to God to meet all your needs. Verse one, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, so I have all I need. I, I shall not want. I, I, I have nothing that I don't need because he's gonna be my shepherd. I stop expecting other people to meet the needs that only God can meet. Now once you've laid that, that's the bedrock of stress management, then you go to the second step, and here's verse two. I need to obey God's instruction about rest. I need to obey God's instructions about rest. You know, so much of the stress in your life comes from always being in a hurry, always working too much, always feeling like you got too much to do. It's why you overwork, you never can get caught up. How many of you feel like I can never get caught up? Let's just have true confession. I can never get caught up, yeah. That's true. Right now, I'm, and I have over 1,200 unread emails in my inbox. I have over 12,000 emails in my inbox. There's no way I'm ever going to get caught up. Just no way I'm ever going to get caught up. Well, so what do you do? Well, you look to God to meet your needs, and then 
you obey God's instruction about rest. There's no way I could say, well, I'll just stay up for the next three months and read all those emails. <laughs> no, you still gotta rest. Now think about this. If God had wanted to, he could have created human beings without the need for sleep. Why did, why, did he, why did he create you with the need for sleep? You will spend one third of your life asleep. Now if God's only gonna give you 60, 80, 100 years here on earth, why wouldn't he give you 100% of the time? Why would one third of that time be wasted in sleep? Because God wants you to learn the importance of rest. Rest is so important, God rests. God modeled it. When he created the whole universe, the Bible says that after he finished all of creation, it says on the seventh day, God rested. Now why did God rest? He wasn't tired, God doesn't ever get tired. He was modeling the importance of rest to your life. And he says every seventh day, you, you rest. And he said that, that's what God did. He modeled it. Now the Bible's filled with instructions about rest, recreation, and relaxation. In fact, it's so important, God put it in the Big Ten. It's in the Ten Commandments. Right up there with don't commit adultery and don't murder and don't lie, he says, every seventh day you take a day off. Hello? That's how important a Sabbath is in your life. Jesus later said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, God said, I created this idea of you take a day off every seven days for rest, recreation, worship, and restoration. He goes, that's my idea, it's for your benefit. It's so you don't burn out. And yet today in our modern society, people aren't doing that, even on their day off, they're working. And a lot of people, even if they go to a church service, then they go home and they go right back to work trying to get done all the stuff they didn't get done during the work week. That's not a Sabbath, that's not a Sabbath. Now, God says, I want you to rest. Psalm 23, verse two says this, he makes me lie down. Circle the phrase, makes me. He says, God makes me lie down. Has God ever had to make you lay down? Because you aren't smart enough to obey what he says about rest? You know, um, it doesn't really matter which day is your Sabbath. In fact, the book of Colossians in the Bible says, doesn't matter which day you choose, you just need to choose a day. My Sabbath is not Sunday, Sunday's a work day for me. By the way, so is Saturday. My Sabbath is Monday. And on Monday, I rest and I refocus and I recharge. And, that's, and I don't do any work on Monday, that's my Sabbath. And by the way, don't call it your day off because if it's your day off, you'll cheat on it. And you say, oh, I got all these things I need to do, I'll do this. But if it's your Sabbath, then you use it for what God intended. You say, but I feel guilty when I relax. Well, Jesus didn't. When you study Jesus' ministry, he often took time off to relax. In fact, he'd go out and do an entire period of intensive ministry, and then he'd say, guys, we need to come apart for a while. We're going off to the mountains, we're going off the desert. We gotta come apart. And I always say, if you don't come apart, you're gonna come apart. And, and he said, yeah, let's go off to the desert. He goes, there, out there where there's these springs and those, those date palms, palms and springs and palm springs. <laughs> and he said, there's a biblical basis for going to palm springs right there, okay? He says, go off to the desert and, and we're gonna go relax for a while. I'm sure they didn't have a jacuzzi to sit in, but it would have been nice. But Jesus didn't feel uh, guilty about it. Did you know that during the French Revolution, they canceled, the French government canceled the Sabbath and said every day is gonna be a work day and after a couple years they had to reinstate it because the health of the nation had crumbled. You need this in your life. You need a Sabbath. I heard about a guy who said to his pastor, he said, Pastor, I tried to get a hold of you all day on Monday. And the pastor said, well, I'm sorry, it's my day off. And, and the man said, well, the devil never takes a day off. And he said, yeah, and if I didn't, I'd be just like the devil. Some of you, that's why you're so mean. You're not getting enough sleep. You're not getting enough rest. You're a little devil because you're not taking the Sabbath. And the devil's not your model. Okay, number three. I, I look to God to meet all my needs. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I obey God's instructions about rest. He makes me lay down, lie down. And then number three, I recharge my soul with beauty. That's the third thing you need to do. Recharge my soul with beauty. Beauty is an incredibly important thing in stress management. Ugliness stresses you out. Beauty inspires. Beauty encourages. Beauty motivates. Beauty stirs up positive emotions. Have you ever thought about why God made the world so beautiful? I mean, you look at sunrises and sunsets, and you look at the intricacies, <laughs> you try saying that, <laughs> of, uh, of beautiful flowers that are never even seen, and all of these sights around the world that many people, well, human eyes won't see, but God created a world of beauty. He could have made Earth just like the moon, just a moonscape, or like Tatooine. For those of you who don't know Star Wars, that's the desert planet that Luke was from. <laughs> Skywalker. And he wanted to get off that planet really quick because it was pretty ugly. Anybody want, should I go on about the gospel according to Star Wars? Yeah. <laughs> he could have made it just a desolate, dusty, gray planet. No, no, God created a planet with vibrant colors. Have you ever heard anybody say, I, I, I heard it the other day when I was on, actually last summer, I was on vacation up in Yosemite. We were under some redwood trees and a, a man said to me, I feel so close to God in nature. Well, of course you do. He created it. Man was made to live in a garden, not in a skyscraper. When God created man, he put him in the Garden of Eden. He didn't put him in a skyscraper. You weren't made to live in everything concrete. God made us to live in, in a garden, in a beautiful place. You know, I've been a pastor for over three decades, and over all that time, I've noticed that people tend to ask the same questions. All of these common questions have common solutions and they're all found in God's Word. So I sat down and I took the most common questions that I've been asked and I began to answer them according to scriptures. And I wrote a little book called God's Answers to Life's Difficult Questions. It provides simple, straightforward answers that you can apply right away. You'll discover the simple truths that God has given to us from His Word. And it's just my way of saying thank you for supporting Daily Hope with your financial gifts. Today, when you support Pastor Rick's Daily Hope with a gift to help share the hope of Jesus Christ with people around the world, we'll send you your very own copy of this great resource. It was this rock concert many, many years ago. Joni Mitchell wrote a song about it called Woodstock, and it says, well, I came upon a child of God. He was walking along the road, and I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going up to Yasger's farm for this rock and roll band. And there's a line in the chorus that says this, we are stardust, we are golden, and we're caught in the devil's bargain, and we've got to get back to the garden. And it's a capital G. She's talking about the Garden of Eden. We've come a long way from the Garden of Eden on this planet. People say, I feel close to God in nature. Of course you do. It's God's beauty, and beauty inspires, and beauty motivates. Notice the next verse, Psalm 23, verse 2 and 3. He makes me lie down, but where does he make me lie down? He makes me lie down in lush green meadows and leads me beside calm, quiet waters. He restores my soul. Okay, he restores my soul. Now, it's no wonder Psalm 23 is the most beloved psalm because we can all visualize this one. When I say, think about lush green meadows and a calm, quiet lake, you relax just thinking about it. Okay, if I say, think about downtown LA, you get stressed out. I say, think about 
meadows and calm waters and babbling brooks. Nature refreshes because beauty inspires. Now, you need beautiful scenes. You need to see beautiful scenes and you need to hear beautiful sounds in order to keep the stress down in your life. You need to add beauty into your life. Let me give you some suggestions, write these down. Number one, get outside every day. If you're not getting outside every day, your stress level is going up. Even if it's just your backyard, even if it's just walk around the block, even if it's take your lunch outside, walk outside of the office, and sit outside and look up at a tree while you eat your sandwich. You need to get in touch with God's creation. You need to surround yourself with beauty. Get outside. Let me give you a second suggestion. Start the day with God, not the media. Before you read any text message, before you check your email, before you turn on the radio, to some talk radio people screaming at each other, before you turn on the television for some morning show so you can hear Bad Morning America, <laughs> you need to get in touch with God first. The first seven minutes of your day set your mood every day. So do you wanna start it with an alarm clock and then the worst news of the day coming at you? No. You don't really need to know all the bad news first thing when you get up. You don't need to know that. You need to turn on some praise music, some worship music. You need to get in touch with God. You need to let the first five, 10 minutes of your day be with the Lord. And that'll dramatically reduce your stress and improve your mood. Another suggestion, number three, intentionally put beauty around you. Whether it's pieces of art or music that inspires you or something, a craft, something that, that you know, I used to collect seashells, and I collected them from all over the world, and I did it, and I had, had my, my, my library filled with them because looking at those things simply inspired me. I go, wow, that, the intricacy of that Nautilus, how God inspired that. Looking at beauty lowers your stress level. Listening to beauty lowers your stress level. So I highly recommend that you either take up an instrument or... Um, or uh, some kind of art or craft to create beauty. You are most like your creator when you're being creative. And so you need art in your life. You need beauty in your life. You know, by the way, art and music are two of the greatest arguments against evolution. Why? Because they're totally unnecessary for human survival. And if the whole survival of the fittest really works, then why in the world do we have music and art in the world? because you're more than a body, and God made you for worship. Did you know more songs have been written about Jesus than any other subject in human history? Did you know more books have been written about Jesus than in any other subject in human history? Do you know that more art has been created about the Bible and to honor and glorify God and Jesus than any other subject in history? Why? God gave us music and God gave us art for one reason, to express emotion. That's the only purpose of it. You don't need it for physical survival, but you do need it to really live, to be who God made you to be. So fill your life with art, and fill your life with music. You know, when I get stressed out, I go home, I pick up a guitar, I start playing a guitar. I sit on the piano, bang on the piano. The ukulele doesn't matter. Kazoo, you know, whatever. Just combing paper. Like last week, you said, make a joyful noise. Doesn't have to be pretty, just make a joyful noise. Philippians 4.8 says this. You'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things that are true and noble and reputable and authentic and compelling and gracious. It sounds like television, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. That is not television. Okay. You'll do best by filling your mind with things that are true and noble and authentic, compelling, gracious. The best, not the worst. The beautiful, not the ugly. Now because of sin, there's a lot of ugliness in the world. There are a lot of unpleasant things in the world. Whatever you give your attention to is gonna either raise or lower your stress. Some of you 
during 50 days transformation, you need to do a fast on the news. I hate to tell you this, but you could miss the news for the next 50 days and it's gonna make one difference in the world. If you read the newspaper one day later, you'd realize how much news really isn't news. The media is tuned to make you think stuff's important that isn't that important, has no bearing on your life. And if you used all the time that you spend listening to news or watching news or reading news and instead spent that listening to God, reading his word, listening to worship songs, your stress would be dramatically lower. It's your choice. Now, if you wanna stay stressed out, keep watching local news because if it bleeds, it leads on the local news. In other words, if there's a crime that happened anywhere within distance, it's gonna be reported on the news. Is that really what you wanna hear? Is that what you really need? Is that gonna make you a better woman, a better man? No. So I recharge my soul with beauty. He makes me lay down in green meadows and calm waters, beside calm waters. Number four, the fourth thing we have is go to God for guidance. Go to God for guidance. Now, this is important because a common source of stress in your life is indecision. You can't make up your mind. Some of you right now are wavering. You're at the fork in the road, or maybe you've got multiple options, and you just can't decide, and the stress is killing you. You can't decide whether to get in or get out or do neither. You got too many choices. I recommend that you make God the number one source for guidance, not the opinions of your friends, not some pundit on television, but that you go to God for guidance because he always tells you the truth. So what I do, I say, God, I need wisdom. And in James chapter one, it says this, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and doesn't condemn them or criticize them. He gives it generously and graciously. God is waiting to give you wisdom. You just have to ask. So you say, God, I need wisdom. And I pray and I ask. Then I read the Bible. I read this book. And then I wait and I think and I be quiet. And I listen and I sense. And at the right time, maybe not immediately, at the right time, God will put that idea in my mind. And he'll go, wow, that's an inspiration. That's what I need to do. I want you to write this down. Write this affirmation down. It's an affirmation. God will guide me at the right time. God will guide me at the right time. Not at the wrong time, and his timing is perfect. He's never early, he's never late. If you have to make a decision about next year, he's not gonna give you the answer today because he wants you to trust him. The Bible says there's enough trouble in each day, take one day at a time. So God's gonna give you the right decision and the right guidance if you'll trust him, but he'll do it at the right time. Psalm 23 verse three says this, he guides me in the right paths for his name's sake. That's an affirmation. God, I believe you're gonna guide me at the right time in the right way. I believe you're gonna do that. And if you have that belief, he's gonna do it. Number four, or number five, I trust God in the dark valleys. I trust God in the dark valleys. Now, we're all gonna go through dark valleys in our lives. You'll go through many of them in your lifetime. One of the fifth common sources of stress is loss. And you can lose your job, and you could lose your income, and you can lose your money, you could lose your health, you could lose your reputation, you could lose a loved one. We all go through many losses in life, and when you go through loss, there are always two common reactions. One is fear, and the other is grief. Now, grief is good, fear is bad. When we did a series of seven messages on grief last year, and remember I said grief is the way we get through the transitions of life. Grief is a good thing. The Bible says God grieves. It's a godly emotion. In fact, if you don't grieve, you get stuck. Some of you have had a major loss in your life in the past, and you just shoved it down. You, you stuffed it instead of grieving. And what, when you stuff it, you get stuck at that stage emotionally. And you've never gone any further because you didn't go through the grief. 
you got stuck and you maybe need to go back and grieve some things in your life you've never grieved over so you get unstuck because you got unstuffed. Stop pushing the, the, the pain down. Just grieve it, let it out. It's not gonna kill you, grief will not kill you. You let it out, it's good for you. It's how you go through the transitions of life. And then you get unstuck and you can move on and you can grow up emotionally. You know, I've been a pastor for over three decades, and over all that time, I've noticed that people tend to ask the same questions. All of these common questions have common solutions, and they're all found in God's Word. So I sat down, and I took the most common questions that I've been asked, and I began to answer them according to scriptures. And I wrote a little book called God's Answers to Life's Difficult Questions. It provides simple, straightforward answers that you can apply right away. You'll discover the simple truths that God has given to us from His Word. And it's just my way of saying thank you for supporting Daily Hope with your financial gifts. Today, when you support Pastor Rick's Daily Hope with a gift to help share the hope of Jesus Christ with people around the world, we'll send you your very own copy of this great resource. 